Well, before the uh, joy of Christmas, of course, there's the sober season of Advent. Sober, meant to make you think and reflect. Uh, the reason why we chose purple is because not only is it a sign of royalty, it's also a sign of mourning. So this time of mourning and preparation for Christmas. What are we mourning about? Well, we'll find out in a minute. But I want to take one of the traditional themes of Advent, and that is the theme of judgment. Judgment. And I want to take uh, that line we recite from the Creed every week, where it says, And he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. Now, the thing about the creed, it's not just there to kind of fill up some space in the service to kind of, you know, it's just material to use. It performs an important function reminding us of the core beliefs of the Christian faith. And these beliefs are what enable us to, as Christians, to live well and to live rightly and to live safely within the boundaries that God in his love has set for us. Just as children are given boundaries at home, what they can and they can't do, what they should and they shouldn't do. So the creed gives us a kind of boundaries, if you like, within which God then can ensure that we are receivers of his love. Or to use another picture, just as railway tracks keep a train stable and upright in order that it reaches the destination it's heading towards, so the words of the creeds are like those tracks that keep us safe and steady and our lives headed in the right direction. We don't go off the path going towards our destination. Now when we read those words about judgment, then it's hard not to find them perhaps a little bit threatening and maybe guilt-inducing. You know, think, you know, will, will I be judged? You know, is there something in my life that's not right? How will I come through it all? It's a bit like the feeling you have when you're, you're travelling on the road one day and uh, you're not sure what, you know, you forget how fast you're going and suddenly a police car kind of pops in behind you and then suddenly you're thinking, oh my gosh, have I broken the speed limit? Is something wrong with my lights? Are my tyres bald? Or is my MOT up to date? You know, all these things flood in your mind because you're afraid once the policeman comes and he's, uh, as, long as, that, as long as that light doesn't go on, you, you're okay. And it's the same thing with judgement. When you think about judgement, you think, is there something in my life that's not right? Will God be happy with me? Have I committed some sin I haven't confessed? Is there something I'm doing that he's not happy with? So all these things begin to flood in us and we think and we start to feel a bit guilty. And the thing is about this judgment as well, there are only two possible outcomes. There's no kind of middle Anglican middle way. You're either guilty or innocent. If you're acquitted, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, if you're found guilty, well, you end up in the other place and the less said about that the better but there's only no middle way you're either guilty or you're innocent and Jesus himself uh, the epitome of love and kindness and compassion actually in his love and compassion warns us about this quite rightly he says there are you know we can either become uh, either be found to be his sheep or the enemy's goats we can either be wholesome wheat or useless tares We can be faithful like the five wise virgins or complacent and careless like the foolish ones. And what happened to them? They got locked out of the marriage feast. You see, the point is this. You see, you and I have been given a precious gift. And that gift is the gift of life itself. And I won't go into the arguments that went through Parliament recently, but life itself is a precious gift And we will be held accountable for how we have used it, what we have done with that life that God's given us. Have we treasured it or have we effectively trashed it? Have we used our time wisely or foolishly? Have we done good to others or have we hurt or harmed them? Those things are are kind of will come up in this judgment. How have we used our lives well or foolishly? Well, the first thing I want to say is that these words, if these words make you feel afraid, then that's not a bad thing. I, you know, sometimes I don't think we're afraid enough. Fear is not always a bad thing, as long as, of course, it doesn't cripple you. Because fear can help you to make the right choices rather than the wrong choices in life. It can help you avoid hurting both yourself and others if you're afraid of the consequences. 
I once read the true account of a, a woman in America who is actually biologically unable to feel fear. Very unusual case. Uh, this 44-year-old mother of three known as SM by a team of neuroscientists in the University of Iowa, she is utterly fearless and therefore, as a result, completely oblivious to any life-threatening situation because she's not no fear to warn her, no warning signs. This report on her note says that she is of normal intelligence, unable to feel other emotions such as joy and sadness and anger, but, it says, she lacks the quick and subconscious response that we all have to danger. Fear is a good way of warning us to avoid danger, to help us to make the right choices. So fear then can be a good thing. And that's why Solomon writes in Proverbs 9 verse 10 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why? Because if we fear God, well, what happens? We respect him. Uh, we will listen closely to what he says and we will take seriously every instruction he gives us because fear makes us focus. Now, it has been said that the opposite of fear is faith. But I think, really, that the opposite of fear is flippancy, not taking th things seriously enough, dismissing warnings that have been given to us for our benefits, not reading the labels clearly, which has that sign in it saying, do not drink poison, you know? Oh, it doesn't matter, you know? We may not like what the creed says about judgment or what Jesus says about having to face the choices that he gives us, but it's better to be afraid and listen carefully than to be flippant and dismissive or complacent. Fear then has its place. And what's more, fear, the right fear of the Lord, is actually can be liberating. Dennis Prager, who is a Jew, in his commentary on the book of Exodus, writes this, he says, the fear of God is a liberating emotion, freeing one from a disabling fear of evil and powerful people. This needs to be emphasised because many people see the fear of God as onerous rather than liberating. To be afraid of breaking the law is a good thing. To be afraid of being thrown in prison or the punishment comes is a good thing because what happens, you'll be, live life in freedom and do the right thing within the boundaries that God has laid down for us. If you truly fear God, and I hope you do, you will be wary of disobeying him, putting yourself in danger, and therefore enjoy the freedom that trust in him brings. There's freedom in trusting God. And secondly, our fear of judgment actually comes from a lack of knowledge. We fear the unknown and the unexpected. But if we know what is coming, and importantly, if we know the person who is going to be the judge, then there will be no need to be afraid, providing, of course, we do the right thing. Because the creed says, and he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. And we must remember that the he there refers to Jesus. And if you know and you trust Jesus, then it'll all be okay. That's the key, to know and to trust in Jesus, because he's the one that's going to be the judge. I remember uh, when my son Ben uh, went for an interview, a very important interview for promotion. It was a, a, a fairly big promotion, but the thing is, he'd be doing all the work of the next stage up anyway, and he'd been working very hard at it. And his boss had actually recognised this and encouraged him to go for the promotion. But Ben was not possessed of great self-confidence at the time, but he knew that he had worked very, very hard. And we saw that as well. And his boss also knew it. Because he worked all the extra hours he could. He never turned down any kind of request for help from anybody. He did everything he was meant to do. He stayed behind the finished projects and often brought his work home with him. But Ben had this nagging fear that the panel he was going to sit in front wouldn't be interested in that. They'll just have their questions. And if he didn't answer the questions properly, then he wouldn't get the promotion that he clearly deserved. So he prepared as best he could, and then he turned up at the job at the panel. And imagine his relief 
where sat down at the end was the very man who had put him forward for promotion. In other words, they may not know Ben, but he did. He knew all the hard work. He knew all the extra hours. He knew exactly what he had done. And so when it came to the interview after, to the discussion afterwards, then I'm glad to say that Ben justifiably got the job because he'd worked the hardest. You see, none of us need to fear judgment if we know who's on the panel, as it speak. If we know the one who knows us. Because if he knows us and we know him, then there's nothing to be afraid of. This is what John means in his letter. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has been perfected in love. What he's saying here is not that you know, we are meant to be or expected to be perfect. Nobody is perfect. So don't think of it as like an attest to perfection when we come to judgment. No, what judgment is a test of is whether we know Jesus or not. Because if we know Jesus, we know he died for our sins. And that all that we have committed and done, that we come to him in faith and confessing, repenting our sins, then he will cleanse us from the sins. That's what the blood is for. It washes away our sins. So if we, if we love and trust in Jesus, then we'd be okay because we know the one who is on the panel, if you so to speak, who's going to judge us, and he knows us. And what's more, this perfect love has come to live in us through the Holy Spirit. We have that perfect love in the person of Jesus with us. I always love that, those wonderful promises in John 14. Just read John 14 sometimes, it'll blow you away. But in John 14, verse 23, Jesus says this. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. He, make our, he will know us from the inside and we know him. Because he is our friend. So come judgment day, when we stand before Jesus, it's not before some stranger that we stand, that's the idea, but before him who is our most dear saviour and friend, who laid down his life for us, and which we have come to put our trust and our faith in. Who with the Father and the Spirit has come to live within us. And so when we stand at judgment day, the question to ask is not just, have I sinned? But have I been forgiven? And is Jesus my friend? That's the question I want to ask all of you this morning. Is Jesus your friend? Is he just some figure on a cross? Is he just a name in a book? Is he just something that gets mentioned in the Bible rather a lot towards the end of it? Or is he your friend and your saviour? Because that's the only thing that's going to get you through judgment. Is to know the one who is going to judge you and me. And if you do then you have nothing to fear. And for, lastly, and I think this is an important one really, there's uh, this natural fear that you and I may have for our friends and our relatives who don't know Jesus and may not even believe in God. And I can say quite clearly, my brother and his wife and my sister and her husband and other members of my family are all atheists. They do not believe in God. They have no time for religion. Although my, my brother, having said that, loves Christmas carols, so work that one out if you can. Um, but anyway, and my father himself always said to me that he could not bring himself to believe in God. There wasn't sufficient evidence, although he said he wanted to. And that may be significant. And so my fear is that I may not see any of them again on Judgment Day. That's a fear I live with every day. But you know, I am not the judge. God is the judge. And what's more, more, I have the assurance from the scriptures that God will do everything in his power and has done everything in power to try and save us. Uh, although he will not, of course, act against our will. And how far has God, to, has God gone to save us? There it is. He came in Jesus to die for us. What more could God do? And also it says in the scriptures, isn't it? God desires that all be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And I was only reading on Friday morning in my, uh, my quiet time these words of Peter. 
who says the Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is his desire and longing. Not that, ever, not that everyone will. Not that everyone will. But that's what he wants, that's what he desires. And he will do everything he can to ensure that as many can be saved as possible. And what's more, he is very fair in his judgments. He will take everything into consideration. There's this lovely, lovely story um, about the shepherds, told about the shepherds in East Anglia, which was the centre of England's wood, wool trade in the Middle Ages. And they had this tradition that whenever a shepherd died, that he'd be buried in a coffin that was packed full of wool. Full of wool. And the idea was this, that when the Day of Judgment came, Jesus would see the wool and realise that the man in the coffin was a shepherd. As he himself had been a shepherd, he would know all the pressures that the man had faced. He would know the amount of time needed to look after wayward sheep and so on. And he would understand why they hadn't been to church very much. Isn't that lovely? God takes everything into consideration. His judgment is scrupulously fair, but he will not force anyone against their will to come into the kingdom, because that would not be love. That would be the worst kind of, um, you know, of, uh, of, of terrible things that you could do, the worst kind of uh, forcing. So they knew, those shepherds, that on the judgment day, God would take everything into consideration and treat everybody scrupulously fair and just. And that does not mean we must presume ever on his kindness or abandon his commandments if we know what those commandments are. We must not spit in the face of God who has done everything for us in Jesus. We must not do that and think, oh, God will save us. But it does mean that even the greatest sinner, the greatest sinner, and if you could think of the greatest sinner in your head, even the greatest sinner, or the most determined atheist, it means that all of them have the hope, or we have hope for them, I should say. For God gives up on no one and will work to save them right until the last minute. Uh, the great Matthew Henry once wrote this. He says, there's one deathbed repentance recorded in the Bible, the thief on the cross, so that no one, he said, should despair. But, he said, there is only one so that no one will presume. Don't leave it till last minute. Don't think I'm going to have a great life first and then, just before it comes the end, I'll say, sorry God, forgive me, let me in. No, says uh, Matthew Henry, don't do that. Don't do that. Never give up praying. Never give up bearing witness to your friends and family. Because God is working in you, which is why you have been chosen, and through you to do all that he can to save them and help them meet Judgment Day with confidence and not fear. That's your role and your, that's mine. So let me end with this. Are you afraid of judgment? Then you should be. For fear is a good motivator to ensure that you and I make the right decisions in life and avoid complacency. For life is a gift and we must live it wisely. Do you want to escape judgment? Then trust in the one who took your place and died your death so that you may go free and be accepted into God's kingdom. As Billy Graham once wrote, if you are believers in Jesus Christ, well, then you have already come through the storm of judgment. That judgment happened on the cross. If you go through that judgment, you won't have to go through another one. And finally, give all your fears about your loved ones to God. Pray for them. Invite them to church. There are plenty of opportunities come up to Christmas. Don't be afraid to talk about God in their presence. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And be sure of this, that God is working hard alongside you and through you to rescue them and bring them in the end safely into his kingdom. So it's a time for sober thinking ahead of the joy of Christmas. Thinking about life, what it is, what it's for, and what is your part to play in it as Christians. Amen. <laughs>